This is Michael Popak, and by the looks of things, it's Legal AF After Dark Time. Jury selection starts in the trial that nobody thought was coming, or some people didn't even want at all, like Donald Trump. Donald Trump's case, prosecuted by the Manhattan DA, brought to you by Alvin Bragg, the first to indict and the first to prosecute. We got a trial, ladies and gentlemen. Don't get tired. Don't get fatigued. Will people tune in? Absolutely. How many times does a former president of the United States get tried in a courtroom for crimes? Exactly zero in our entire history. But it starts this week, and we cover it exclusively here on Legal AF. Take a listen. Popak, there's almost like a script that takes place before every Trump trial. He does the same schemes, the same lies. It's the same playbook over and over again. There's the threatening the judge, threatening the prosecutors, threatening the witnesses, whining about the gag order after threatening all of them, tries to do everything to stop it from happening. And when that kind of finally fails, he then puts out statements saying he's going to testify or he has others put out statements on his behalf saying that he's going to testify. Heck, even during the trials, he's got people who say he's going to testify, he's going to testify, and then he does not do that. We saw that in E. Jean Carroll. We saw that in the New York Attorney General civil fraud case over and over again. This is what he does. And so he held that weird... Unhinged, strange, unhinged press conference at Mar-a-Lago with the uh, spineless new speaker of the House, MAGA Mike Johnson, who was there like nodding his head like, OK, uh, whatever you say, Donald. OK, OK. Ha, ha, ha. OK. And then Donald Trump during that press conference, though, was asked if he plans to testify at trial. Here's what Donald Trump said. Let's play it. You plan to testify in your trial? Anymore? Yeah, I would testify. Absolutely. It's a scam. It's a scam. That's not a trial. That's not a trial. That's a scam. If you read Jonathan Turley, if you read Andy McCarthy, if you le read the legal, they said there's not even a case there. That and then he's, asked, then he's asked if he thinks it's risky to testify, and here's what he says. Play the clip. I'm testifying. I tell the truth. I mean, all I can do is tell the truth. And the truth is that there's no case. They have no case. And Again, you have to read the scholars, read all of the legal scholars. I haven't seen one legal scholar that said this is a case. And in fact, even you people said, oh, gee, that's too bad. This is the first one. All of them are scams. They're all about election interference. We have. You know, by the way, at that same press conference, one of the things that Donald Trump was saying is he goes, everybody agreed that Roe v. Wade needs to be overturned. Every legal scholar, every person agreed that Roe v. Wade, he lies about every single thing. I don't know, maybe his kind of right wing extremist in the Fox and Newsmax echo chamber say that but that's just not true. And um, I want to get your take in a moment, Popak, if you think he's going to testify. But just to remind everybody, remember during the E. Jean Carroll first trial where um, uh, Donald Trump was found liable for sexually assaulting E. Jean Carroll as well as for defamation. That's where Joe Takapina was the lawyer uh, at that time. Um, remember Donald Trump literally fled the country. It was a civil case, so he was allowed to leave, unlike a criminal case where he has to stay. But he fled to Scotland and Ireland and, and was there during the trial. He was like holding a shovel and pretending he was uh, like building something, which he, he wasn't. Um, and then he was out there playing golf. And then he was asked if you're going to show up and if you're going to testify. And then Trump said, Yes, I'm going to confront this woman. You remember this? Let's play the clip. I have to leave Ireland and I have to leave Scotland where I have great properties. I have to leave early. I don't have to, but I choose to. Will you attend the trial, Mr. President? I'll probably you, attend. And I think it's a attend. disgrace. It's a disgrace that it's allowed to happen. It's called false accusations against a rich guy or, in my case, against a famous, rich, and political person that's leading the polls by 40 points. And I have to go back for a woman that made a false accusation about me. And I have a judge who's extremely hostile. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to confront this woman. This woman is a disgrace and it shouldn't be allowed to happen in our country. So you, 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 you
Of course, he did not go back. He did not confront E. Jean Carroll. Um, in fact, federal judge Lewis Kaplan in that case um, paused the proceedings even, which is unheard of. No other litigant would have that opportunity. And federal judge Lewis Kaplan said, hey, I just saw this press conference that's being reported where your client, Joe Takapina, says that he's going to show up and testify. I don't want him to whine and complain and say that he's been treated unfairly. So is he going to testify? And then Trump's lawyer, Joe Takapina, said, I know you understand what I am dealing with, Judge. He's not going to be testifying. And then in the New York Attorney General civil fraud case, Alina Haba said that Donald Trump was going to testify on direct examination. She held a press conference and said that we should expect him. Remember when she said this? Let's play that clip. He is so firmly against what is happening in this court and so firmly for the old America that we know, not this America, that he will take that stand on Monday. He will open himself up to whatever they want because he's not afraid. People that are afraid cower. President Trump doesn't cower. We'll be back on Monday. Popak, I wanted to lay all of that out. And you know, we, normally in these legal AFs, unlike some of the other shows we do here, it's not very video driven because it's, but I think it was so important just to just to show you those clips to see the absurdity of of all of this. And just also, you know, the uh, the, the, the scripted lies that are told. What, what do you make all of this, Popak? Well, let me start with the, the easiest answer. He's not testifying. Um, there is every time Donald Trump has ever decided to testify and or participate in some way in his cases, albeit civil cases, he has not only lost, he's lost with, with a magnitude that is um, uh, almost incomprehensible. He doesn't testify in the first E. Jean Carroll case, um, and um, despite the threats that he would, uh, and that's the Joe Tacopina line of issues that you talked about, and the jury comes back and says, you're a rapist under New York law, or technically a rapist, and you defamed her and awards her, E. Jean Carroll, $5.5 million. He then, there's a second E. Jean Carroll case that you, that you outlined, and he decides he's going to testify and does testify. And now he's got Alina Haba as his lawyer instead, as you just showed the clip. And now what, is the, what does the second jury do after listening to him confront E. Jean Carroll, defame her again, including in the courtroom, during the proceedings, in social media? The jury says, I got an idea. Why don't we increase the $5.5 million to $83.5 million? So how'd that go for you, Donald, in testifying? Not great. And then we move forward to the New York civil fraud case where he said he, he did testify Remember in that one, he took the Fifth Amendment in deposition four or five hundred times, then thought better of that and asked to be deposed again and so that he would testify. Then he gave a several hour deposition that was terrible for him in video, including the now infamous that tanked him twice, the now infamous um, uh, moment where he could not identify and misidentified E. Jean Carroll as being his one of his wives, Marla Maples, in the photo with his then current wife, Ivana Trump, just to show you he's unhinged, he's mentally in, mentally feeble, and then so and then this is on the on the heels of him saying that she wasn't his type. It's just well, if he's not his type, well then why do you think that's the woman you married? And that killed him in front of at least two juries. And so, in that case. He he um, uh, he uh, gives his deposition and all of that, and then about his financial affairs, and then he decides he's going to testify. He testifies. Then he decides he's not going to testify a second time, but he wants to do part of his closing argument. And so we say he's going to do his closing argument, and he and the judge says, "I don't know, Mr. Trump, you want to do party closing argument? Do party closing argument." Stands up, does three or four minutes of bullshit. And the judge says, great, thank you very much. And then $465 million judgment later. Uh, so every time Donald Trump does get around to testifying, not when his liberty is at risk, he fails and fails miserably, crash and burn. The reason I don't think, while it makes for great political yep. theater and fundraising, why I don't think he testifies is that um, there is just a tremendous amount of risk of him going to jail. And since the person that is responsible for sentencing him, 
which is Judge Mershon, also gets to evaluate witnesses and credit them or discredit them at time of sentencing, it puts him in a very dangerous position to testify because he's uncontrollable. The lawyers won't be able to coach him properly or prepare him properly because he's he's genetically incapable of being prepared properly to tell the truth in a courtroom or otherwise. So you got that going for you. He may try to override his lawyer's best in his best instruction and say he's got to take the stand. But I don't think he does because, turning to your other issue about sentencing, if he loses, and just to refresh everybody's memory or those that are new to our channel or this story, this is a two-step criminal process in terms of the crimes that have been charged. The first one is a misdemeanor normally. It is 34 counts. Uh, normally would be a misdemeanor, for uh, a crime, but a misdemeanor for business record fraud in New York. It becomes and ratchets up to a felony because it has to be, there has to be a second crime that the first crime of business record cover up fraud was being used to facilitate. You don't have to charge the second crime. And that's why he hasn't been charged with a second crime. But the second crime has to be presented as the, um, as the object of the reason the business record fraud was done. And so, we, we sort of know it from the indictment, but there's still some waffle room in there. The second crime that will be not charged, but but shown to the jury is going to be some combination of um, tax evasion, that he took the business deduction by making Michael Cohen's, the payments to Stormy Daniels went through Michael Cohen first in a repayment plan to Michael Cohen, including after the guy was in the White House. And uh, all of those payments uh, were probably taken as a business a business deduction on his tax returns. You got tax, you got election interference or election fraud, right? Campaign fraud, both state and federal, and, and things like that. And so that's the second, quote unquote, uncharged, but has to be proven crime. If the jury concludes that there's been both the business record fraud and the, which is a misdemeanor, and the second crime has been properly made out, that's the that is the felony, a lower level felony. The sentencing for that is anywhere from probation to house arrest to one to up to 20 years total, if you add up all of it. Uh, 34 counts, it would be hard to, I mean, if you, did, if you didn't do it sequentially, it would it'd be, but I think it's a concurrent sentence. So a high end is 20 years, not going to happen. The, 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 the vast majority of people that practice law in New York, including me, think it's going to, if he gets sentenced, it's going to be somewhere between one and three years, okay? and there'll be jail time. Judge will have to figure out what that looks like with somebody that's either the president of the United States at the time of sentencing, God God forbid, or is not, but still has yeah. service protection. And so they'll have to put all of that together to decide where he's housed, an old military base, a hospital, who knows? But that's where he ends up. So to answer your earlier question, he's not testifying. But we'll get a lot out of you and I and Carol will be able to report on what happens during jury selection, because during the voir dire jury selection process, you'll hear the lawyers say uh, some version of the following for the defense. Do you understand? And the judge will instruct you that my client does not have an obligation to testify. He's got a Fifth Amendment right not to testify against himself. If he chooses not to testify himself, you understand you can't hold that against him. And, and can you be fair and impartial knowing that my client may or may not testify at trial? And if he doesn't testify, uh, you won't hold that against him in terms of making your decision. So we'll know they'll put some sort of placeholder in there. I don't think they're going to commit to him testifying in front of the jury, because if they decide down the road that he does it, that's terrible for the defense. Popak, talk about jury selection. That's what's going to be starting on Monday. Yep. The process of selecting a jury is called voir dire, V-O-I-R, another word, D-I-R-E, quite literally translates to to speak the truth. It involves uh, the process by which, uh, you know, you probably know this if you've ever gotten a summons for jury duty, you show up, you're in, you're there with ton of other prospective jurors in a room. There's going to be a lot more prospective jurors than maybe the room that you were in, in then. Um, and the lawyers 
uh, then asked questions of prospective jurors about whether they could be fair and impartial. If they can't be fair and impartial, they can be disqualified uh, automatically just for cause because they can't be fair. And then lawyers have a certain amount of peremptory challenges that they can disqualify jurors for any reason at all, provided that it's not discriminatory, you know, when you're disqualifying people on the basis of race, gender, ethnicity, or religion. You can just basically, it's, it's almost a uh, version of an at-will employment, <laughs> but for selecting jurors. Um, yeah, this juror is claiming they could be fair and impartial, but I don't know. They watch a lot of this type of news, and I, I just don't think they're going to be fair. And they, they don't make a good juror over here. And there's a certain amount of those challenges. Popak, take us through that process because that's what's going to be starting this week. Yeah, for sure. And I'll I'll try to do a Patreon on that just to have it up there in our library. And voir dire is a very interesting word that you and I all learned in law school. My southern-based professors called it voir dire. It's pronounced different ways throughout the country. It's generally pronounced voir dire. It's it's both French, but really Latin, because in the French, it means si se, but in the Latin version, where we think the voir dire actually come from, it means to speak the truth, which is what you outlined. New York has a very interesting selection process, which is slightly unique. The judge presides over it. That's not the unique part. They're going to bring down a, a veneer panel, probably 40 at a time, 30 at a time, depends on which uh, courtroom the judge is going to be in and how big they are. New York's courtrooms are no, and he's not even in the nice courthouse uh, where this trial is going to be held. It's going to be held in the, there's two main courthouses. There's the one that everybody knows from night court, uh, the start of that TV show, you know, that beautiful one on center street. Then there's the one across the street, which is the criminal courthouse, which is not that nice. And so these courtrooms are a little bit cramped. So he'll bring up as many as he can, um, as uh, he'll have, he, he's already told the people responsible for jury selection, the jury process in New York court system, how many the judge, he's told them how many he wants, brings them up. Now there's going to be a, uh, there is a questionnaire with 42 questions on it, but the first thing the judge is going to do is try to do a first cut and lop off. He's got to fill 12 seats because they do the jurors, the actual jurors first and all the process through that. And then they do the alternates, up to six alternates. It's up to the judge how many of one to six there are. And I'll talk about what happens if any of the real jurors, the regular jurors, uh, if they if they can't make it one day or they get sick, what happens during trial? And God forbid what happens during deliberations, because it's not good for the prosecution if it happens during deliberations. We'll, we'll hold that for a moment. I'll, that's a cliffhanger. So he brings up these people. Judge does first cut to try to fill 12 chairs, numbered one to 12. Whoever finally occupies chair number one is the four person. This is not a system. Uh, the New York is not a place where, uh, like on TV and, and other places, where you go in the back on the first day of deliberation uh, and the jury picks their four person. Four person is number one. Doesn't matter who that person is, what their background is, what their language skills are. If they can be fair and impartial and they've made it through the voir dire selection process, they've made it through the challenges that each side have. We'll talk about that in a minute. They are the four person. And then the judge does tries to figure out without polluting the rest of the jury, a potential jury that's sitting there, who can't be fair and impartial. Raise your hands. <laughs> okay, you know. And then the judge, without getting too deep into it, because you don't want to have somebody get up on a soapbox and start doing a pro-Trump campaign speech or an anti-Manhattan DA speech, you, you you sort of figure out who you can pick off right away. Boom, get them out of the room. Literally, get them out of the room, and everybody moves up in the chairs. And then the judge says, now it's time for the questionnaire. And the judge will do a questionnaire and the results of which, remember, this isn't, an, or, or to, for people that, that lost track, this is an anonymous jury because of Donald Trump's bad behavior, misconduct, attacks on jurors and everybody else that participates in the criminal justice system. Just as it's been, it was an anonymous jury for E. Jean Carroll twice in that case, and the one in Georgia is going to be anonymous, all because of Donald Trump. That means the lawyers... And the uh, the lawyers each for each side know the names and addresses and backgrounds of the people, but Trump doesn't and won't. And he's been barred from that. And we won't know what they look like or what their demographics are, nor will sketch artists, because that's all we got in New York. We don't have TV. We don't have audio. We don't have YouTube. I was jealous in Georgia to watch every minute of everything in Georgia. We don't get that in New York. You and I and Karen are going to have to report from either Karen and I getting in the room one day 
which I know she's working on and I got a way to get in, <laughs> or we have to rely on other people that are in there that we trust that will give us the reports and then we can do our own, our own analysis. So now the judge goes to the 42 questions. Who here believes, the, who likes the Proud Boys? I'm not kidding. These are some of the questions. Who likes the three percenters? Who has a MAGA hat at home? Who watches their news on MSNBC? Who gets it from Fox? And everybody like you and me, or they're picking a jury. We've got, I've got a giant, I use a giant piece of oat tag, like a big, like cardboard that I've sketched out with the jury box. And I start taking my notes and I start. And then when that's done, that's information gathering. That's the voir dire, if you will. Then it's turned over to the lawyers, prosecution first. And that, and in state court, they're given a, a, a wide latitude, a big berth to ask these questions. In federal court, that's why they pick a federal jury like in two days. It's really run by the judge. Very little, you can, you can ask very little in voir dire uh, as, a, as a lawyer. State court, it is a free for all. <laughs> there, there's case law that says that everybody has the right to, to get to the bottom of finding fa of, uh, fair, uh, 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 impartial jurors, and you can ask what you need to. So you try your case almost like you're opening. You know, and, and when, when you get that chance and you start, you can ask the prosecution goes first and starts asking questions either collectively. Who here, you know, has a MAGA hat at home? Raise your hand. OK, you write it down. Um, then you can go specifically and you do follow ups. OK, uh, Mr. Garcia, uh, Mrs. Goldberg, Mr. Jones, you said you heard. Bup, bup, I saw you react and you interact with them. It's a way to start building credibility as a trial lawyer. It starts then doesn't start at opening. You're building your relationship with the jury as a, as a lawyer then, both defense and prosecution. They're done. They, they, they put their case through. You know, they did a little bit of their opening statement. They've asked their questions. They've taken their notes. They know who everybody is. They know name, rank, and serial number, age, profession, uh, you know, occupation, uh, uh, educational background, where they live, and they know those. And then they get this other stuff out. Then the, then the defense stands up, does the exact same thing in their own way, educating the jury in their own way while, while also getting information. Then that's over. That period of like questioning the jury is over. And now we're up to the challenges. First challenge is for cause, meaning this person is obviously <laughs> incapable of being a full and fair juror. They've been on the Trump payroll before. They used to work for the Manhattan DA before. They know the witnesses. They've seen Stormy Daniels perform somewhere, whatever. That's usually a four-cause challenge. The judge will lop them off right away and remove them from the jury from the jury box. Okay, you get out. The next people in line move up in the numbered chairs. Then we go prosecutor first. We go to what's called peremptory challenges. In New York, you get 10 apiece in a criminal case. So, so you get 10 for absolutely no reason or good reason. You can just get rid of 10 people. And, the, and then the defense goes and does the same thing as you keep moving people into the box, right, to fill it. That's why this is going to take a week. This is not going to be, if anybody thinks it's a Monday event, there's going to be lots going on that you and I and Karen can report on about stuff that happens when the jury's not around and motion practice that's still going on, you know, until that plane takes off for the actual opening statement. But jury selection is going to take a minute. We'll be able to report on it as best we can about the results. I think later in the week, maybe even rolling them the following Monday, we'll have a jury. We'll have to see. Now, once the peremptory challenges are done, the only thing you can't do, just to answer a question that will come up in the chat, the only thing you can't do is you can't use your peremptory challenges to get rid of like all the women, all the black Americans, all the Hispanics. You can't target ethnic groups, because then there's a challenge to that. And the judge can say, yeah, I don't think that's the right, put them back. <laughs> and there's a whole process related to that. Once the peremptory challenges are used, 10 apiece, and the four causes are used, you've got your 15. And you can't, there's no backseats. You, you, let's say you use seven out of your 10. You can't go, oh, I want to now get rid of three and eight. Done. You're done. Those are, the, those are your 15 locked and loaded. They get sworn in as the jury. We start the process all over again with as many alternates as the judge is going to allow here, which is about six. Little quirk of New York jury selection and the alternates I want to talk about, and then I'll turn it back to you, Ben. The, the alternates, 
are no, unlike in some other court systems, they know they're alternates, but they also are like, you know, they're like on the bench in a baseball team and they know they could be put in at any moment. You know, center fielder pulls up lame. Oh, Bill, got to go in, go. So they got to take notes. They got to participate. They just don't ever get to deliberate if the, if they're not needed. But if they're needed, somebody gets COVID, something happens, something bad happens in somebody's life and they can't go to court anymore, then they're off and not temporarily. It's not like the juror just steps in for a moment and then he comes back out. I mean, that juror is off and alternate comes in. So that's why you need four or five or six for a six or eight week trial, which is what this is estimated. That's fine during the trial process. The, 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 the exit and entry of new jurors happens happens all the time. I've never been in a trial longer than two weeks where we didn't lose a juror at some point. Now, you go to deliberations, which is the trial's over six, eight weeks from now. And you still got, and you, we, we say, thank you for your service, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, or whomever uh, alternates. And the jury of 15 goes to deliberate. Somebody gets sick, dies, injured of the 15 during deliberations. You don't go with 14. And you can't pull an alternate unless the defendant agrees, Trump, which means it's an automatic mistrial. We lose one of the 15 during deliberations. It's a whole new game. It'll be a mistrial. Judge uh, Trump won't agree. And we'll be trying this case again three or four months from now. That was a as thorough as a review of the jury selection process in terms of what to expect on Monday, as you will hear anywhere. And I thought it was so important, Michael Popak, that you went through the nuances to guide everybody through like, okay, so what is going to be happening this week? Look at the nitty gritty DNA molecular level information you get only on Legal AF. I defy any other program, any other commentator on YouTube to do what we do day in and day out, just like that. Practicing lawyers who know what they're talking about at the intersection of law and politics. How refreshing. <laughs> like sometimes we kid that we're almost never wrong. Sure, we're wrong sometimes, but we try not to be. And we bring it to you only the way we can with our special brand of analysis on Legal AF. Tune into the Midas Touch Network for all things related to the uh, first criminal trial of Donald Trump. You can't ask for a better a better lineup. You got Michael Cohen, who's one of our commentators. He's a witness in the case. We got Karen Freeman Ignifolo, former prosecutor in the office that's prosecuting Donald Trump, and me, Michael Popak, practicing lawyer in New York, doing defense cases in the courtrooms like I'm talking about right now. If you like that kind of legal AF, you don't know about our show, join us every Wednesday and Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And then on YouTube platforms, you know, I'm sorry, on uh, even I can't get my intro right, on audio podcast platforms of your choice. If you know all about Legal AF, maybe you missed the show, there's a clip. If you, if you didn't miss the show, take that clip. You can be part of our homegrown marketing department. Send it off to friends and family and ask them to take a listen or a watch and join us for our next show. Until my next hot take, till my next Legal AF, till my next Patreon exclusive content. This is Michael Popak reporting. Heary, heary, Legal AF Law Breakdown is now in session. Go beyond the headlines and get a deep dive into the important legal concepts you need to know and we discuss every day on Legal AF. Exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, all for the price of a couple of cups of coffee. Join us at patreon.com slash legal AF. That's patreon.com slash legal AF.